Mr President, it hardly needs to be said, but I'm going to anyway, the time given to scrutinise this bill is completely unsatisfactory. I know there are some who believe we should just tick everything the government states it has a mandate for um, and tick that off, but I'm not one of them. Suggestions or claims that because this was a pre-election promise, or predominantly pre-election promises, that it should be just accepted and passed without full and proper scrutiny denies the role and the importance of this House. Any government policy that requires legislative change must come through and be approved by the Parliament. If it is bad policy, one that doesn't or won't achieve the stated aim or may not be in the best interest of Tasmanians, it may be rejected when subject to full and proper scrutiny. This is regardless of pre-election promises. I note that this year hundreds of election promises were made. Some were shared with the people of Tasmania, making it impossible to know what the broader community thought of each one. In addition, we didn't see about 100 election promises that the Premier seemed to believe that he still has a mandate for. Mr President, we must do our job. The approach of undertaking full and thorough scrutiny of all matters that come before this House is what I do. It is our job, it is what the people of Tasmania want us to do, and it is what the people of Murchison elected me to do. <coughs> as members know, we are taking this bill under suspension, as it needs to be dealt with before the end of this financial year. The delay is partly due to the March election, but regardless, full and proper scrutiny of such a detailed and complex bill is necessary. To try to expedite this, the Treasurer wrote to us about the impending bill, or wrote to the leader who passed his letter on to us. It was helpful and I contacted him immediately, uh, I received this letter, seeking a briefing and a copy of the bill as soon as possible. The Treasurer did agree to a briefing before the bill was tabled, um, but would only arrange for this uh, for a time one hour prior to budget being delivered and the, and the bill being tabled in the other place. This made it more difficult as within two hours of that briefing we had 650 pages of budget papers to read in preparation for this and next week. Mr President, I, do, I certainly appreciate the briefing that was provided and the opportunity to further discuss my concerns and my thoughts with this bill, but we really are under pressure to fully consider the significance and the, and of this very complex bill. Mr President, in his letter of 7th of June addressed to the Leader, the Treasurer says the measures are not controversial. But Mr President, the, measure, the measures cover three of the taxes that we rely on to raise our own source revenue. At the very time we were in grave danger of losing some of our 65% of revenue that comes from the Australian Government, we need to start looking at how we might survive. Or do we wait for the apocalypse before we try and find Plan B? Mr President, what if we had to raise another $100 million in state taxes? How would we do it? Which of our taxes are fair? Which taxes are efficient? What is an efficient tax? <coughs> we need to have a better understanding of our tax system. Normally a bill like this would give us opportunity to canvass these matters. We should be looking at each proposal in the bill, of which there are many, and try to understand how it satisfies the benchmarks of being fair and efficient. Mr President, all taxes result in a loss by a person burdened with the tax. But the reason for raising state taxes is to fund services which people want, and in some cases have a right to demand as part of a civilised community. Most people would agree this includes a roof over people's heads. But if the contribution of one member in this place in the budget applies any indication, this may not be a universally accepted view. The reality, Mr President, that taxes have, have different impacts. The three taxes covered by this bill are payroll tax, stamp duties and land tax, which I'll come to shortly. The other matter in this bill is the first time owner grants and proposed concessions, which I'll consider first. What it, whenever this matter comes before us, I always remember the quote, which I will re read to you. It's hard to think of any government policy that has been pursued for so long in the face of such incontrovertible evidence that it doesn't work than the policy of giving cash to first home buyers in the belief that in doing so promote home ownership. These are the words respected and often quoted by members in this place, Mr Saul Eslake. He made the point in his often quoted speech, Saul Eslake, 50 years of housing failure. These words were also included in his submission to the Senate Economics Reference Committee, <coughs> and that was reported in the Australian newspaper in January 2014. Mr Eslake continues in his, um, his speech, the um, 50 years of housing failure, and he says, cash handouts for first home buyers have simply added to upward pressure on housing prices. 
enriching vendors and making those who are, who are already housing who already have housing feel richer, whilst doing precisely nothing to assist young people or anybody else into home ownership. For that reason, I often think these grants should be called existing home vendors grants, because that's where the money ends up, rather than first home owners grants. Thank you, Mr. President. It is disputed by many in the industry, and having been a real estate uh, agent myself, I have found that I'm quoting an economist, and I'll keep going. You can comment on yours. Mr. Mr. President, Ms. Mr. Eslake does concede that since grants have been confined to new homes only, the effects aren't as bad, as they tend to add to our housing stock and do provide some stimulus to the construction sector. With regard to this, he said, I have no doubt that some of the increased grants to first-time buyers of new homes will end up boosting developers' or builders' profits, but I accept that at least some of it will induce a supply-side response to any resulting increase in demand for new houses, while considerably fewer taxpayers' dollars will be wasted inflating the, pricing, the prices of existing homes." End quote. So, Mr President, it was very pleasing to see the Treasurer was on a unity ticket with Mr Saul Eslake in 2014. And I'm sure members recall Treasurer Gutman's comments soon after taking over the important role of Treasury. When he was speaking at his second reading speech um, of the, in the downstairs, and it was also repeated by the leader in this place, um, when we were debating the first Home Owner Grant Amendment Bill 2014. And the Treasurer said, and I'm quoting from the second reading speech of that bill, it, mean the bill, is supportive of concerns that broadly based ongoing first home buyer assistance does not make housing more, housing more affordable for first home buyers but instead may inflate the price of property. It also better targets the assistance to more directly stimulate housing construction and increase housing supply. Reiterating, in quite Mr President, reiterating what Mr Paul Eslake had said. So the decision back then was to confine the assistance to new houses. The extension of the first time of what I call builders grant, which relies to, you know, um, provides for the um, building of new homes, in the current bill does come at quite a cost. I had, a, had us been provided with the financial modelling last week, um, when I had the briefing on Thursday last week, and again early this week, um, and we were provided with that briefing just a very short time ago at the briefing, and um, it's appreciated. And it is helpful, that, um, inf that uh, table that was provided is helpful, and I would seek leave, Mr President, to have it in court, uh, to have it to table it, have it incorporated into hands only to my contribution at this point, because it's a table it's difficult to read, because um, it is relevant to my comments. So Honourable Member seeks leave. Uh, table, it yeah. You can, you can table the... Yeah, the, I seek leave to have it tabled, oh. incorporated into hands. So the Honourable Member seeks leave. Is leave granted? Those of that opinion, please say aye. Aye. If the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Thank you, Mr President. Um, so I will note some of the cost <coughs> things. Um, most are revenue foregone, of course, um, rather than um, new revenues, except for the foreign investor surcharge. Um, and the impact of the extension of the first home owner's grant or builder's grant on uh, new properties is $5.1 million over three years. And that's, that's the um, additional um, impact, or the ongoing impact, I guess. What I've, what I've been able to glean prior to having this information, which is, uh, which is, it's good to have now on the record in, this, in my contribution here, has been through Finance General, chap uh, Finance General Chapter in Volume 2 of Budget Paper, um, the Budget Papers. It states that the budget for 2017-18 was $13.4 million for this particular area. I do ask the leader, um, what's the estimated outcome for that particular outlay? That was last year's budget, or 2017-18 budget. I mean, there's not, not a, a line for the estimated outcome in this area, uh, so I do ask if she's able to provide that. The budget year, this budget year coming, the 18-19 year, includes the cost of $9.1 million, then $4.7 million in 2019-20, followed by $2.9 million each of the last two years of forward estimates. Excuse me through you, um, Mr President. Could you just ask for a question again, exactly what you're looking for? 
I'm asking um, for, from, in Finance General um, Chapter and Budget Paper Number 2, this year's, this year's budget, um, it, it's on page 103. It gives you the, under the administrative expenses, it tells you how much the first time builder assistance, which is what I'm talking about here, is, um, has been, as la this currently we're in budget, was 13.4 million, um, and then the forward estimates are there. But I'm interested in what the estimated outcome is. The estimated outcome is not listed in this. So that's, that's the question. Um, and I ask is, is that what the first home builders grant measure has contemplated by the billable cost? Is that these figures, is that what it's expected to cost? So uh, it's, it, I think it, maybe it's clarified by this information we've been given as to what it will cost, but I only got this a very short time ago. Um, so Mr President, given that the first home builders grant extension was a promise made before the full extent of the housing crisis was apparent, because that was made apparent after the election, uh, so, you know, not before, as it seems to have been suggested, um, we were, inf were informed that it was made as a budget promise um, in the uh, briefing following the housing summit. But regardless, I dispute the Treasurer's assertion that this is not controversial, um, given what we know about it. Um, and I must say, we haven't had a lot of information about it, except for t this morning when we did get this uh, costing at the briefing. Uh, but I'm sure... And I'm not sure, though, that the, the extension is the best use of the scarce funds we have, or the for revenue foregone, in the current climate. Because it, it, it does, in the table I've um, referred to, mean an extra $3.3 .3 million of, of revenue foregone, which is revenue we need to find other places to provide services that could perhaps be better spent in other areas of housing. So that's, a, that's an opinion. Um, but it is, it's not an insignificant number. So, I've lost my place here. So, Mr. Mears, I wish to move on to the duty concession or provisions in the bill. One relates to concessions for first home buyers for a 12 month period. And according to the budget papers, the calculation of concessions on page 86 of volume one of the budget papers, this will cost $6.7 million. And again, that's a lot of money, Mr. President. And again, I'm not sure everyone will consider this as an uncontroversial matter. Mr. President, it will apply, as I've mentioned, to existing residences. Mr. President, whether as, uh, assistance to first home buyers of existing homes is given by way of grant, which we used to do, and the Treasurer got, the current Treasurer got rid of in 2014, or a duty concession, the effect on prices is the same. We have that on no lesser authority than the Treasurer himself, back in 2014. I say this as the proposal will, before us will have the same effect as the first time owner's grant, which we agreed to remove in 2014. It does not increase the available housing stock. It will, it will make the current housing stock, especially those homes under $400,000, which is the threshold, more expensive as a result of the inflationary nature of this policy on house prices, as noted by the Treasurer in 2014. And now, um, well, I know, perhaps one, and at least one member may argue this is not the case, but the Treasurer himself has said this sort of measure on existing homes, rather than, uh, rather than assisting that people into home ownership, may inflate house prices. And this has been supported by Mr Eslake and many other informed economists Australia-wide. Mr President, the majority of first time owners in our regional areas would be looking to buy a home under $400,000. And I certainly in my electorate, I mean, particularly in parts of the West Coast, you won't find a house over $400,000. Um, and if they're, particularly if they're seeking to enter home ownership, they're not looking for properties over that value, they're looking for something at the lower end of the market where they can possibly get in. The inflationary nature of this policy risks pushing more houses up in price within that bracket. Pushing them further up, some will be pushed out of the price range as a result, because the vendors will see there's the opportunity, these people are gonna get this money, so the price is pushed up. Um, and, and even those below the 400,000 will have their prices inflated 
to the point that may push it out of the reach of someone who could have been able to um, afford it if it hadn't been subject to such infla inflationary considerations. So I accept that it may only be in place for one year, Mr President. There is that um, provision in the bill to, to enable it to um, either be extended or not by way of a disallowable instrument. Um, but we know in this place that once it's in, under the same government, with effectively the same parliament, essentially, it will not be easy to remove regardless of the effect on property prices. Mr President, this is bad policy. If it was bad back in 2014, it's even worse now. The government is actively inflating the price of houses. <coughs> Mr President, this is bad policy. Mr President, another duty consection in the bill is the reduction of duty for pensioners if they downsize into a smaller home. This is estimated to cost $1.9 billion according to the budget papers um, on page 86. And I note um, in the uh, table we got today it says $2 million, so I was pretty right. I mean, it's a slight difference, but not a lot. As I've said, this should have... The, sorry, should this have been the time um, when we are spending more... Um, Overall, um, this should be a time we're spending more time discussing the virtues and vices, if I can call them that, of particular taxes, rather than just chipping away at them and narrowing the basis of so many. Mr President, as you know, um, conveyancing duty is only triggered on the change of property ownership. This gives um, a very narrow base of ownership transfer costs. Some people hardly ever pay conveyancing duties because they remain in the same place. They don't sell the house, don't move. Some people pay a lot, um, particularly if they need to move for employment, for example. The narrow base leads to a high rate of conveyancing tax. And as we know, all state governments have been addicted to conveyancing taxes, including us. There is a disincentive for homeowners to move <clears throat> because of high rates of conveyancing tax. This means that housing stock is used less efficiently than it would um, with greater mobility. Conveyancing tax is not an efficient tax. The move to reduce the duty for pension is based on sound economic arguments um, in broad terms, and that, for that reason I don't dis disagree with it. Uh, where I have a reservation is that the bill only relates to pensioners. If the tax is currently if, as currently applies is inefficient, that inefficiency affects everybody. Not just pensioners have to move sometimes, or choose to move to downsize. If it discourages um, the current arrangement, discourages mobility <coughs> for pensioners, it probably discourages mobility for everybody, including, as I mentioned, those wanting or needing to move for whatever reason, whether it be jobs, family, could be anything. That's why when we talk about taxes, we need to try, all try to get onto the same page instead of just ticking off a measure proposed during an election campaign and actually understand what we're doing. And pardon my cynicism, potentially it can be seen as a way of buying votes and being politically populist. Not necessary, not necessary to fix a bad tax. If it's a bad tax, we need to take a different approach, I'd suggest. Offering concessions to what is a bad tax might help a few who benefit the concessions but the disadvantages, it, it, it continues to disadvantage those left paying the bad tax. Mr President, I'm speaking in relative terms. For, uh, um, th that is what happens when you have taxes with narrow bases. Those who pay are at relative disadvantage. Tampering at the edges of a bad tax often only makes it worse. Mr President, I don't have any have concerns with the extra duty on foreign purchases of property. I understand this is happening in other jurisdictions as well. But I do have a um, couple of questions on that, and they were covered in the briefing, but I hope the leader can uh, res respond in her reply. Why are the different rates there for residential properties and primary production land? Um, and to, uh, the other question I was going to ask is how much will it raise? And according to our um, table that was provided, um, the foreign investor surcharge over the... Um, four years from 18, 19, sorry, through, yeah, um, to 21-22, it's $26.7 million. I know that's an estimate we don't really know, obviously, but that's the, um, the Treasury modelling of um, so $26.7 million over that period. So I'm just, um, I, have, I have that answer to that now. 
Um, I notice um, these changes to particularly the foreign in, um, investor surcharge should have been included as policy changes in the policy and parameter statement in the budget papers. But the footnote uh, in budget paper number one in the policy and parameter statement said they were parameter changes. How can a change of policy be a parameter change? It's a policy. Maybe the government didn't want people to think that they were actually increasing any taxes. They were increasing for foreign people, not Tasmanians. But how could it be a parameter change when it's clearly a government policy? If they're parameter changes, we wouldn't be here today discussing the bill because parameter changes we don't have any control over. They're policy changes. And, I, and, um, and I, you know, we expect to know, and I would have thought it would have been in the um, policy and parameter statement as to what the impact was going to be. So there are three measures in the bill that propose changes to payroll tax. Payroll tax was handed to the states by the McMahon government in the early 1970s. Since then, the base has narrowed and the rate has risen. What was once a reasonably fair tax has degenerated as all states have fiddled with the rate and the thresholds, trying to make their state more competitive. It's only applied to a few in, fin in fundamentally what's been a race to the bottom. Now, only large employers play. Small employers and self-employed persons don't. It's widely regarded as anti-employment and probably, in my view, beyond repair where we've got to. And, but as Saul Aslake pointed out in his recent opinion piece in the Mercury, and I quote, we need to stop fetishising about, sorry, fetishising small business. It, so isn't, you know, no, it isn't the engine room of the Tasmanian economy. Its share of employment in Tasmania has dropped from 56% to 45.5% over the past decade, end quote. The payroll tax threshold is designed to help small business. But just as the first homeowners um, a builders grant was supposed to um, help increase home ownership, sorry, not the first home builders, the first home owners grant and we got, that we got rid of in 2014, um, was supposed to help home ownership, it has failed. As I pointed out above, the payroll tax system designed around helping small business has failed. The percentage, percentage employed by small businesses has fallen. Because the current payroll tax base is too narrow and the rate too high, I can hardly complain about reducing the rate to 4% for payrolls between $1.25 million and $2 million. But I would like to know what the effects on government revenue will be. They are policy changes, and again, they weren't determined as policy changes in the policy and parameter statement. Um, and we see here that it'll be $35.2 million in the information we were provided with in the briefing. So I'd also like the leader, if, she's, if she could, to um, explain the figures on page 85, budget paper number one, in the tax expenditure statement. Um, I know Mr. she might have suggested... Well, I was going to say, I know the leader would pretend to say it's a matter for estimates. Hmm. But it directly concerns the bill, so it'd be helpful to have the answers now. Um, and I'll put it anyway. <laughs> the cost of the tax-free threshold will fall for 2018-19 on that table on page 65, budget paper number one. How is that possible, such a large fall? The threshold hasn't, cha threshold <coughs> hasn't changed. What is the cost of the reductions flowing from reductions in the rate from payrolls between $1.25 million and $2 million? The policy and parameter statement changes <coughs> includes, include the payroll tax changes due to the threshold, but these are policy changes. So I ask the leader to reconcile the figures, the cost of the proposed change by reducing the rate for payrolls between $1.25 million and $2 million with the concession calculations. It's already marked. Yeah. <laughs> it's relevant to this bill, but yeah, I, I accept, yeah. I did say that, I'm sure the leader will say, it's a matter for estimates. <laughs> the big question, Mr President, with payroll tax is a narrow base. There is nothing particularly inefficient about a tax on labour. If it was applied broadly, it would be fair and efficient. If it applied broadly, it would, uh, sorry, not just to large employers, but to everyone, in receipt of income from labour. 
For goodness sake, Mr President, we personally don't carry the burden of any payroll tax, yet employers and employees of large companies do. How is that fair? If we can't fix the inherent problems of a tax that has such a narrow base, perhaps it's time to scrap it completely. I did write an opinion piece about this recently. Get rid of it. If we continue to just, just, you know, erode it and destroy it, which we've basically done, get rid of it. And negotiate with the Australian government, I say and, not, it needs to be done in conjunction, negotiate with the Australian government to help me implement a lower rate um, on all labour earnings. That's what the PAYG system does. It would be much fairer. I know some people are attracted to a higher GST as a solution, but GST is a tax when money is spent. But a low rate on when money is earned is just sufficient. It gets money into government earlier, and it doesn't distort patterns of employment between small and large employers, between employed and self-employed. It's a low rate tax applied when it's earned rather than when it's spent, and it's fairer because it's more progressive. It's a well-known fact that, the, that higher income people save more and spend less on a relative basis than lower income taxpayers. And hence, a tax on earnings is fairer than a tax on spending. I have less concern um, with payroll tax rebates for apprentices and, tra and trainees, except to point out that if the system was, so, was broadly based at the lower rate, we wouldn't have to fiddle around the edges as we constantly do, or was got rid of altogether. The same argument applies to the payroll exemption and applies to relocation of businesses to regional areas. Do they work? The recent Vodafone experience always puts doubt in my mind about the effectiveness of such relocation incentives. I'm not violently opposed to them, but do they work? Or is it a case of big businesses blackmailing governments to hand over some cash or let the businesses keep more of their own, in their own pockets through foregone revenue? Just a question. Rhetorical question, yeah, potentially. Yeah. yeah. Finally, to the land tax changes. As any students of student of economics know, and as the Henry Review pointed out, land is an efficient tax base because of its fixed supply and its immobility. Land is immobile, it doesn't move. We're not making any more of it. They are in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, perhaps a little bit in Iceland and New Zealand. <laughs> A low rate across the board doesn't affect investment decisions. Every landowner pays regardless. We're talking about unimproved land here, Mr President. Land taxes were introduced for the, re for the very reason to promote economic efficiency. That's why they were introduced, to create economic efficiency. To discourage speculators from sitting on land banks waiting to make windfall gains rather than putting the land to more productive use. Yet land taxes are reviled by some. And that's because we've narrowed the base and increased the rate. Rates, on pro rates are property taxes, like land taxes, and they are more efficient. They cause less, less distortions because there are fewer exemptions than there are with land tax. The current system discriminates against land use for commercial purposes, which is the exact opposite of the rationale for the introduction of land taxes in the first place. Productive activity was to be encouraged rather than land speculation. Our current land tax exemption system distorts economic activity by granting land tax-free status to principal residences. From that viewpoint, it is anything but an efficient tax, and it promotes speculative activity in residential housing. So regarding the one-year one year land tax exemption for newly rented former short-stay accommodation properties, acknowledging my views um, that the current land tax arrangements are not equitable and distort activity, to me, it makes absolutely no sense to limit this exemption. If we ought to have it, why well, have it just in the Greater Hobart area? I know from talking to people living on the East Coast and Member Prosser's electorate, that access to rental properties, especially during summer months, is next to impossible. And this is at a time when the workplace, uh, workforce um, demands increase, with tourist numbers swelling in that, in that area. So workers have to live somewhere, they can't get accommodation, and sometimes people are forced out of their homes. So it's not a problem just related to Hobart or the Greater Hobart area. Of course, we don't see the, the Mercury or um, even the Xana or others putting front page um, stories about people up the East Coast. I'm sure the member for McIntyre will talk about this as well. 
But it really is a problem. It may not be quite such a problem in my electorate, in parts of, but I know it is on the east coast where there's, a, you know, there's been a lot more growth in tourism, particularly during those summer months. So people wanting to work in these areas can't find accommodation, as many of the houses that are put out into the short stay market. Often they are just closed over the winter and not used at all because the owners have made enough money over the summer to, with full occupancy, rate, uh, full occupancy at high rates. Um, and then they go and have their own holiday somewhere in the north. <laughs> uh, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not criticising people for doing that. That's, that's what is, is happening, and that's OK. Um, but if you're going to try and incentivise people, why well, would you just restrict it to the Greater Hobart area? So I really cannot understand why this narrowing of the exemption was made. And I hope the leader can provide a very good reason um, for this. Uh, otherwise, I'm not sure um, why would I support this section of the bill. And I know the member for McIntyre has proposed an amendment regarding this, um, and we'll get to that at a later time. I'm sure she'll speak about it herself. But I, I'm not sure that the bill, as it's prepared, would actually provide enough protections to avoid rorting if it was just extended out without you know, a look at the whole matter. And as I say, it's 100 pages of legislation, not all related to this particular part, but it does require. Um, close scrutiny to ensure that there's um, loopholes aren't there, and that's one of the challenges. Um, so the land tax changes proposed in this bill are not totally objectionable, um, but they wouldn't be necessary if we had a fairer system of land taxes with a broader base and a lower rate. The current land tax regime, as well as our income tax system, encourage the activity that the proposed bill, change in this bill, is designed to address. Mr President, I can't help thinking that all the change proposed in this bill are patch-up jobs for the state tax system that is in massive need of a complete overhaul, but which no one wants to talk about. Too politically sensitive. If this bill is about addressing some of the housing affordability and accessibility challenges facing many Tasmanians, we need, really need to look far more broadly and be willing to engage across the political divide and fix our broken tax system. If anyone wants to argue that it's not broken, I will have to disagree with them. Then I ask them um, if they agree that, or they argue that it's not broken, I ask them why we've got a bill like this delivered in such haste? Why do we keep tinkering around the edges in the guise of making it better? Yeah, I think it, oh, well, I'm saying you can't make a um, silk purse out of sow's ear. These measures don't make it better. They don't make it fairer and they don't make it more sustainable. In an article published on Je John Menadieu's Pearls and Irritations Making, Hous Making Housing Affordable Series, and published on the 2nd of May 2017, um, saw Leslie again um, in, a, in a paper titled The Causes and Effects of the Housing Affordability Crisis and what, and can, what can and should be done about it. Mr Eslake made a number of suggestions to what the states and ter territories could and should do. And he, Mrs Eslake has spoken a lot about this issue and he is well regarded around um, economic circles and by members of this parliament who quote him regularly. He said, and I quote in this, um, this article, <laughs> state and territory governments can contribute toward enhancing people's capacity to become homeowners by, first one, scaling back cash grants and tax exemptions or concessions for first time buyers, which simply allow buyers to pay more to vendors than they otherwise would. First point, and we're not following it. Second one, replacing stamp duties with a more broadly based land tax, with no exemptions for owner-occupied land, but with appropriate transitional provisions to avoid double taxation of reach and purchases, purchasers, um, so as to eliminate the disincentives which stamp duties create for people to move home as their needs change, as well as to provide state and territory governments with a more predictable and stable source of revenues. So what do we do? We tinker around the edges. Third point, reducing upfront taxes and charges on land developers and builders for the provision of suburban infrastructure, permits and inspections, or simply revenue raising, whilst recouping revenue foregone through increased municipal rates or land tax, and working with the ACCC to ensure that reductions in upfront taxes and charges are passed on to new home buyers. And next point, reforming planning laws to reduce the scope for frivolous and vexatious objections to redevelopment of existing residential sites at higher densities and 
increasing investment in urban transport infrastructure to improve access to and from new suburbs to places of employment, entertainment and recreation. End quote. So Mr President, the solution to housing affordability, and according to Saul Eslake and others, and access to homes in the rental market is much broader, much broader than tinkering around the edges of some of our least efficient and least fair taxes. It includes planning reform, it includes in investment in infrastructure to link up our communities. Ramming this bill through Parliament is the way the government is in this way, the government is doing epitomises the complete disinterest of governments past and current to have a meaningful discussion on tax reform. Whilst I won't be voting against this bill, I will be considering an amendment related to the eligible first home buyers concession for established homes under the value of 400000 to remove this section, which is had to be part seven of the bill, due to its inherent inflationary impact on the housing debate, uh, so the, in, in, sorry, the inflationary impact on housing valued at 400000 or less. But I will decide whether I proceed with that amendment, Mr President, um, after I've listened to the whole debate. But um, it, is, it isn't in the best interest of um, first-time buyers. It's in the interest of vendors um, and uh, property agents who collect their percentage based on, on the value of the property. So that's, that's not me saying that. I am saying it, and I agree with that. But it's many more people much more knowledgeable and skilled um, in this area. Um, many economists around the country, uh, I've quoted Sel Lees, like I could have quoted uh, many others. Um, but that is the reality. So I will, I will listen to other members' contributions, but I really think we're going back to the future. The Treasurer's gone back on his very sensible decision of 2014. I commended him at the time, com continued to commend him every time we've looked at um, re extending the First Home Builders Grant, which does have a, a marginally infl um, infl inflationary um, impact, but not to the extent the First Home, first home Owners Grant of build, um, existing properties does. Um, but I can't believe we're doing it. Question is the bill be read a second time? 